Today, friends, I'm obsessed with Christina Pluhar. Who is Christina Pluhar, you might ask. That is a good question. I'm gonna tell you. So, number one, she's the only person other than Lady Gaga who can pull off blunt bangs. Period. That's it. That's right, girl. The only person. You, Lady Gaga. Blunt bangs, no one else. Everybody else quit. All right, so, Christina Pluhar, if you don't know who she is, which first of all, that's a mistake. She was born in Graz in 1965. So um, she's Austrian. Is that right? Is that where Graz is? It's in yes. Austria, right? Okay, anyway. So she's a theorbist, a harpist, a conductor. She's the founder of this amazing group called La Peggiata. Now, if you don't know what a theorbo or a Baroque guitar is, here's some cut out examples of what they are. They're kind of like a guitar, but from a really long time ago. Now, I, so, so today, like the way I'm gonna walk you through like why I'm obsessed with her is through five tracks of hers, off of her albums that made me completely obsessed with her. She does this crazy thing. Like, so she's an early music, like Baroque music specialist. She does all of this, like, Renaissance music, Baroque music. She sources music from like not just the European tradition, but like South American music. It's crazy from like all over the world from hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So she like specializes in that. But as a fun twist, like every other album, she decides to throw a jazz combo in with these like early music instruments. So everybody's like very confused, but it's amazing. So what I did is I pulled together five clips of the Christina Pluhar and L'Arpeggiata like versions of these things plus what they usually would sound like in their like original iteration so that we can kind of hear the difference and kind of hear like why she's so rad. Maybe she is the Lady Gaga of Baroque music. Is Christina Pluhar the Lady Gaga of ancient music? Are you? Are you? Girl, I know you're out there. I know you don't know how to use the internet too because you haven't updated your website in about 10 years, but we're gonna help you. So I hope somebody shows this to you. Somebody please show her this video. I wanna work with you. Desperately. I've lost all my jobs and I need work. I love you. Okay, anyway. <clears throat> So the first piece that I'm obsessed with, and this one is a great intro. Like anytime I introduce Christina Pluhar and L'Arpeggiata to anybody else, I play them this piece. So um, there's a Handel opera called Alcina and interspersed into the like singing parts. The So in a lot of Handel, like you have these symphonias that were originally designed so that they could like change the set and like things like that without you noticing. And so there are these little tiny compact like instrumental riffs in between pieces. And so a really classical and historically correct version of this, it comes from this album, which is, I think this is William Christie, and this was actually, this is a recording with Renee Fleming singing it, but you're not going to hear her, she's going to sing on this. But this is like a very like traditional, correct recording. Still good, but this is what it sounds like. I slaps like 800 times. I'm trying to be relevant with the kids. So. You can get tired of it. Okay, and that's it. It's only 45 seconds long in the opera. Like, that's all you hear of it, which sucks because it's actually kind of cool. But this is how our good friend Christina decided to interpret it. And now this is one of the albums that she did. This is from an album called Handle Goes Wild, which you can find on Spotify. I'm pretty sure you can find it on Apple Music. You can find it anywhere. We're gonna link to everywhere in the description that you can find all of these things and all of these people to follow them and support their work because you should do that. But here is how her and her friends do it. And this is kind of long, so maybe I'll skip around in a little bit. So she takes a 45 second thing. This is how it starts. This is not anything like what we just heard. It 
was on for a while. This clarinet guy is like letting the spirit move him. Kind of hear the like little boom, thum, thum, going underneath. Handle going wild. This doesn't sound like handle. Not to me. But wait. Maybe the jazz people aren't going to play anymore now. Like, maybe we're just going to go back to only hearing the sort of traditional interpretation of this, which would be fine. That's amazing. That's beautiful. Or maybe we're going to circle back and have them all play it once now. Come on. So good. Drum set guy's getting into it now. He's been waiting to play for so long. He's so excited. Amazing. So good. That's the first one. I literally play that for people all the time, and I always like watch their faces and they're like. piece that I super, 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 super love of hers is from an album that's a little bit older. So this is from um, her Purcell album, which is excellent. Um, okay, so Died on Aeneas is a really excellent opera, which is best performed in the catacombs. Um, however, this is Dido's first aria. It's the first time you hear her sing in the entire opera. And she is pressed. She is pressed with torment. This one's Jana Baker. It's a good one. Oh, good. She's beautiful. So you kind of get the idea. This is like one interpretation of it where it's harpsichord. It's very like sparse. The focus is on this like emotional statement that she sings probably 300 times. She's pressed with torment. But when we let Christina have it, this is what she does to it. I'm in like a Baroque jazz nightclub. Everybody's wearing berets. People still do that. Wear berets. She's 
not having to work to make this good. She's just endeavoring to make it slightly different, which is amazing. Speaking of the Lady Gaga of ancient music, the actual Lady Gaga of his day was Monteverdi. Monteverdi was amazing. He wrote everything. He's actually the person who wrote the first thing that we really call an opera that's in the Western opera tradition. And it was Orfeo and it was in the King's Palace and everybody was like, very quietly. Anyway, so, but it was amazing. And if you go back and you listen to Monteverdi's music, like the madrigals, all the stuff people were singing, he was like the pop musician of his day. Everybody was singing his madrigals. They all wanted to do it like at home and at parties and like, be like, oh, did you hear the name Monteverdi Madrigal? Yeah, it's like so good. It's about a dying dove. And it was like a thing about sex. I don't know, I don't understand. So Monteverdi, biggest, like biggest name in music, he also wrote uh, like, like a lot of other music just for people to be able to sing. And one of the duets that he wrote that I always think is like incredible no matter who sings it is called uh, Zefiro Torna. And it's for two voices that just sort of like spin the same melody back and forth. It's really cool. It's not even like net per se from an opera. It's just like some cool pop music from 1610. So like, here you go. So this is sort of, this is sort of a very traditional they she doesn't do a lot to this i just sort of like the way it like grooves a little different but this is magdalena kojana's version from her monteverdi album which is really good and i think she's an amazing interpreter of early music as well um but this is her version which is very very like very traditional still good very traditional Like, this is the original version. Modern Verity is a star. Are you kidding? Cool. Beautiful. Beautifully done. I would say these are probably the most sexy, but I love, I loved her version of this because I feel like she sort of like picks it up a little bit. Takes a little quicker. The drummer in there. This Monteverdi, this is from her Monteverdi album, which in general is like slightly more on the traditional side. For her, like you don't necessarily have a jazz combo in there with you, but you do have sort of these really liberal interpretations of tempo and of instrumentation and what we're gonna use when. I think that's super cool. See, that's already like very different. It's much more like it's more things layered on top of each other. This is Philippe Jarewski. You can follow him too. Anyway, so cool. Like just sort of brings like this very different flavor to everything she does. Like I can tell when I'm listening to something almost that she's touched it because of the like energy that she pulls in to how she like energizes these pieces with this, I don't know, with like a bop, right? Like <laughs> do you feel like you're just like, like no matter what she does. She's amazing. You're amazing. I'm gonna get blunt bangs. Fan bangs. Okay, um, so this next one is very, very different interpretations. So the first singer you're gonna hear do it, I wanted you to hear Kathleen Battle singing a personal song called Music for a While. Music for a While has been put in all kinds of stuff too. If you go watch The Favorite, you'll see them performing music for a while. This, is, this was a super popular chamber piece for singers to be singing back when Purcell was writing music. Like people wanted to do it, it was very, very popular. If they had radios, it would have been on the radio. But they didn't because they didn't have electricity. So, this is Kathleen Battle singing music for a while. Very beautifully, I might add, in its pretty traditional form in the way you would have heard it when Purcell wrote it. It's 
So it's just this like soul. Sound. When Christina Pluhar and L'Arpeggiata get a hold of it, and Philippe Jaruski, who is an excellent singer, modern singer, someone singing very frequently, what they decide to do to it. Where is this Baroque jazz nightclub that she works at? I want to go there. I'd be the only person there drinking alone. <laughs> yeah, Christina! That would be me. That's me at your Baroque Jazz nightclub, okay? Like, he hasn't even sung a note yet, you know? I, and that's what I like about this, too, because I think a lot of times, like, we talk about opera, we talk about vocal music, and sometimes we don't talk about how much work the people that, like, those voices are sitting on top of do, right? So, like, like walking bass. Y'all should go follow Philippe Shersky, he's a good singer, good ass singer. I'm imagining to make a counter tenor sound this loud, he's like swallowing the microphone, but he's like, oh, oh. don't put that in. But like, that's interesting that like, the vocal line can be exactly the same in something and making tiny changes to the way that's supported and the other instruments you hear changes your experience completely. And I think that's the same with hearing a different voice because I have a different experience hearing Philippe sing it than I do hearing Kathleen Bow sing it. Both are excellent, but they're different. And that's why I want to sit and listen to both of them. That's why I have both of them on a playlist because it's a different piece, even though it's the same piece. All right, y'all heard of Leonard Cohen, certainly. I hope so, he died, it was sad. Everybody seemed really sad about it on social media, even people who just heard his name the day before and then they were like, he died, and then they were like, I've always loved Leonard Cohen, but they had never heard of Leonard Cohen. One of Leonard Cohen's most famous songs is Hallelujah. I'm sure you've all heard this. I'm sure you all know it, but this is what it sounds like. Now I've heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. But you don't really care for music, do you? Do you? It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift. Our friends at L'Arpeggiata hear Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah like this. Baby, I have been here before. I know this room, and I got a harpsichord the in there. You've got a, like, I, don't, I can't tell if it's like a lute or a zirbo or what, but it's like a baroque stringed instrument. You have a modern drum set. Cool. And that's proof that like music from any time can influence music and instruments and voices that primarily practice in music from any time. We've been doing music the same way for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. We've just slightly changed little things about the way we like to listen to it, the way we do listen to it. And it's amazing no matter what time you catch music at. I don't know how to convince you to love music. I don't know what to tell y'all about this. This is cool. I really don't. It's cool. It's cool that there's probably what, like 10 instruments on the stage and five of them are probably, there's, I hope people from Arpeggiata are like, there are 50 of us. I don't know, like they're so mad in the comments. I don't care how many of you there are, you're all great. And um, yeah. I'm obsessed. I'm upset. I don't know what else to say about it. I'm upset. Period. Obsessed! Obsessed. What are 
are y'all obsessed with? Tell us in the comments. Hey, so here's the cool part of these videos. Like, not only do you get to hear me talk about what I'm obsessed with, you do not have to take my word for it. If you would like to hear the full versions of all of these songs, you can click somewhere that the internet people told me that we put them and find our playlists on Spotify and Apple Music and our YouTube for this obsession video and for any other obsession video. Below, it'll be below, they tell me.